We're live. We're live with Braut Pronunciation Week. And uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, presentation. It's not the end of the week yet. We still have uh, a couple of presentations, but today is a very special one. And I'm gonna leave the floor to my fellow moderator, Eduardo, to introduce our very special speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here with you today to introduce uh, Adrian Underhill. He's a trainer and consultant, uh, writer and speaker. Uh, he's an author, of, he's the author of Sound Foundation uh, and his pronunciation chart was developed into an app for students and teachers, winning an industry award. He works with teachers and school leaders on developing schools that learn and intelligent schools organizations. Adrian takes a holistic approach to teaching and teacher training. So without further ado, I give you Adrian Underhill. Break a lag, Adrian. Hello, everybody. Uh, I can't see you, but I'm pretty sure you're there. Um, it's very nice to be talking to you. Um, it's always very nice to spend time in Brazil, or if not in Brazil, uh, with the company of Brazilians. I've spent many a happy day and week in Brazil, and it's, uh, I have uh, fond memories of people and places, so it's uh, good to be <clears throat> in touch with you. Now, uh, we have a topic. Actually, we could talk about a lot of topics, but the topic we have is pronunciation. And um, I'm going to uh, have a little PowerPoint, which I guess will be available to you. And I'm going to say a few things and also try to demonstrate uh, some things to you. And uh, please forgive me if I get lost in the software a little bit, because I think that might happen. Uh, and I think towards the end, uh, you will be able to put in some questions or any time. Perhaps you can put in questions. Uh, and Bruno and Eduardo at some point will convey those questions to me because I can't actually see them on my screen. <clears throat> but uh, and I can't see you on my screen either, but I'm sure you're all looking beautiful. Uh, OK, well, look, <clears throat> um, do feel free to interrupt uh, via these uh, moderators and to ask anything you want to ask or to say anything. Or to throw anything. I don't know how you throw things on this particular channel, but if you want, you know, there must be a way. Let's yes, go. There's a chat where they can chat with us. Okay. And please interrupt and convey any chat to me that needs conveying. So, look, this is what I intend to do. Can you see the screen or not yet? Can you see my PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, not yet. Okay. How about now? Uh, let's give it some time. Have you have you pressed the the share screen button to the left? Uh, let's see. Well, I thought I did, but let me just go back. Do it again. Let's do it again. All right. So now I'll click the green arrow and share. And now I think you should see something. Can you see that? Maybe I need to make it bigger. Can you see this? Just a second. Yes. Okay, now, so that's the title. We won't stop there. Let's move on. Uh, this is some uh, resources. This really could come at the end. So there's a slide there which says about videos and apps and blogs and training courses and stuff like that. So that's there, but we're not going to dwell time on that right now. Um, <clears throat> let me just say a few things uh, about uh, my view of pronunciation. Then I'll take you on a guided tour of the PRON chart. And then I'm going to show you how to help students to make new sounds. And then we'll have the questions at the end uh, or during, if you want to put them during. So there's kind of four phases. Here's the introduction. Um, pronunciation is not just an end in itself. It is for easy intelligibility of connected speech. Pronunciation serves connected speech. Never forget that. It's obvious, but we forget it. The whole point is not pronunciation teaching, but comfortable intelligibility in connected speech. Second, now this is obvious, but everyone forgets it. Pronunciation is everywhere, all the time, in everything. There's nothing that you can do which doesn't have pronunciation in it. Even if you don't touch pronunciation, every lesson that you do from beginning to end, every single activity has 
pronunciation every single second of the time. There is nothing which isn't pronunciation. You can read a text and in your inner ear, there is pronunciation. Uh, you can think about writing and compose something in your mind and there is a voice in your mind in pronunciation. Uh, pronunciation is in absolutely everything. The only choice is this. If the student, if the teacher is not teaching uh, pronunciation, the student is required to default to their mother tongue pronunciation. So they end up associating new language with mother tongue pron. So if you do nothing, they've, they've learned uh, pron, old, old mother tongue pron with uh, the new language. If you do something, you have a chance of changing that. So don't forget, there is no one that isn't a pron teacher. Everyone is teaching pron even when they do zero about it. You know, that's pretty cool and pretty shocking. Uh, therefore, what I've just said follows. Pro, uh, every lesson is a prom lesson, whatever you're doing. Now, here's something else. Teach your own accent. Don't fret about accents. Don't fret about the, your pronunciation. Just teach how you speak and, uh, you know, stop worrying about anything. And at the same time, expose your students to multiple accents. It's pretty obvious and it's pretty easy to do these days through songs and, and uh, online movies and so on, and even other teachers in, in their school. Just get people interested in different accents. No accent is correct. The better accent is just the one that can be understood better and more comfortably. So that's what better is. Sure, if people want to learn a very pure pronunciation like spoken in a certain place, they can do that. Uh, if they have the time and the interest, anyone can do that. But that not, is not the aim of most language teaching. We want people just to understand easily, comfortably and enjoyably and express themselves. That's the key. Now, this is important. Uh, there are two kinds of knowledge. This is, goes for everything, but in particular for physical activities. You can know about pronunciation. You do your diploma course. You read the books. You know the charts. You know how sounds are produced. You write essays and you pass. But still, you could be hopeless at teaching pronunciation because all you do is know about it. On the other hand, there is proprioceptive knowing. That is to say, physical knowing. The knowing where you know what your muscles are doing and can feel what your muscles are doing. It's the difference between uh, reading a book about dance and being able to dance. Uh, knowing about prawn and being able to, uh, to pronounce things or to teach things. So uh, I'm interested in proprioceptive knowing, and that is the essence of this approach. Proprioceptive is a, is a word from, um, from neuro... Uh, from neurology, and it really refers to knowing what your muscles are doing. It's a kind of kinesthetic, um, a kind of kinesthetic sensing of what muscles you're using and how much. Uh, we, it's a very interesting area. We could say a lot about that, but it's important not to mix uh, muscular internal physical knowing with this kind of intellectual knowing about. Western education is terrible at this and, and mixes them up all the time. <clears throat> I don't hear anybody protesting yet, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, on that subject, embodied pronunciation. This is, uh, you don't have to agree with me, but this is my complaint. That current methodology, all this beautiful stuff that, that we read about and, and, uh, and pass exams in, is detached from the physicality of PRON. I call it PRON for short, pronunciation. And our uh, methodology is dominated by cognitive representations of what goes on in the mouth. We talk about it. It's just the same as what I was doing just now. We talk about it rather than sensing it firsthand. I'm kind of exaggerating a bit just to make the, the point clear, but, I, but my exaggeration is only a bit. <clears throat> now, as far as us teachers are concerned, uh, what is embodied pronunciation? Really, it's this, reconnecting with the four core muscle buttons, I call them buttons, but you could call them groups. I call them buttons because everybody likes buttons all the time, pressing buttons on the computers and buttons and everything. Uh, the four core muscle buttons that make the difference of pronunciation so that those muscles can do it differently. Differently from what? Differently from the mother tongue. Four core muscle buttons. What are those four cores? Number one, lips. What do they do? Well, they do a lot, but actually when you look at it, it's pretty simple. They spread when they go back and they round when they go forward. That's what lips do. They can do a little bit more, but that's pretty much it. If you can do that, you're there. Second group, the tongue. What does that do? It moves forward and back. 
it can curl around a bit and especially it can kind of retroflex that is when the tip goes up and it seems to curl upwards but essentially you can just think about it as moving forward and back that's what the tongue does third the jaw the jaw moves up and down that's pretty much all it does when it moves down the tongue can move down because there's more space but that's about it uh, when the jaw makes more space the tongue can take more shapes and that's it and that's about it for the mouth because the fourth thing is outside the mouth is before the mouth in fact it's the voice and the voice is essentially on or off and if you're making um, it's on you get a voiced sound unvoiced you get a, a kind of a <clears throat> an unvoiced whispered sound so those are the four muscle buttons now when you learnt your first language or your first languages as a child, you were in touch with all of those. Uh, then, quite rightly, as you grow older, six, seven, 10, 12, 15 years old, um, you, you lose touch with those muscles, just as you lost touch with the muscles that enabled you to crawl and then walk. They become habituated. It's quite right that they do because there's other things to be learnt and we can't pay attention to everything. So we need these habits. But these habits get in the way when we're trying to learn something different. So when you want to learn a new dance at the age of, at my age, or in your 20s, uh, you've got to go back into your body and teach it something different. When you want to learn a new pronunciation, same thing. You've got to somehow get behind the habits of the mother tongue. You cannot repeat your way out of mother tongue habits. That's you know, another ghastly um, misunderstanding. Um, of our current methodology. So this is the conclusion. Unless you know what's going on in your mouth, you can't help your students. But remember what I said about knowing. Unless you know. What kind of knowing? I'm not talking about that stuff on your diploma course. That's useful, but that's not, that's not number one. That's not what's going to help your students. No proprioceptive knowing. The knowing of your body. The knowing of your body when you play a musical instrument or when you ski or when you dance. Pronunciation is a physical activity. So unless you know what's going on in your mouth, you can't help your students. But don't worry. No fear. It's really easy. You don't have to know before your class. All you have to do is look in, find your mouth and sense what's going on in your mouth. And then you can, you are free straight away to help your student. Go to your mouth to see what's happening, then help your student. Like they say, uh, on the airlines, put on your own safety jacket first, then help the kids. It's the same. Go to your own mouth first to find the prom, then go and help your students. Now, see, if you don't know what you're doing in your mouth, you can only say to your students, repeat after me. And that's what our method does all the time. But really, you'd be more honest if you said, I don't know what I'm doing, but anyway, repeat after me. But we don't say that. We tend to miss out the, I don't know what I'm doing. We just say, OK, guys, repeat after me. But that's not a really efficient way of doing it, because uh, with mother tongue habits, you cannot repeat your way out of a habit. OK, a couple more slides, then we're going to get to the chart. So what I'm saying in summary is there are two problems. I think I think there are two problems with our current methodology. And I have, but you don't have to believe me, <laughs> two solutions. Physicality is the first. Uh, pronunciation is a physical activity. I've just said that, and I keep saying that, and I can never say it enough. So teach it physically. Kind of obvious. Get behind the habit. Reconnect with the muscles that make the difference. And what I often say is, that uh, teaching prawn is more like teaching dance than it is like teaching grammar. We're all the time teaching grammar and vocab, which you can say is a kind of cognitive activity. You know, grammar is like problem solving. You go to any of our course books and in our lessons, and it's a, a big problem solving activity, which is a lot of fun and, and, and very interesting. But prawn is not a cognitive activity, it's a physical activity. It's kind of like more, it's much more like teaching dance. There's a, a wonderful choreography in the mouth. Just to say an individual word has a choreography to it. It's a, a physical activity. Proprioception is something worth studying. And uh, uh, for all of these things, by the way, you can go to my blog, adrianunderhill.com, 
and you'll find uh, loads and loads of short articles on every aspect of this, all of them practical with, with ideas for what you can do. And as I keep saying, repetition does not get you out of a habit. And the second problem and the second solution concerns the chart. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that to most of our students and indeed to some of us teachers, pronunciation seems mysterious, endless. What is it? What's it made of? How much is there? You know, where do I get it from? How do I how do I grab it? I can see grammar written on a page, but where you know how do I how do I get hold of, of pronunciation? Is there a map? And the solution, one solution, I think an important solution, is this uh, Sound Foundations chart, which we're going to look at in a moment. And that is indeed a geographic map That's it, and provides a visible and a kinesthetic thinking tool. And what it does is that it shows in one gestalt, that means in one look, in, in one view of your eyes, uh, in just one, in one symbol, in one icon, what it shows is first, all the sounds for all the words for all connected speech. That's a big claim, but it's not, it's, it's very nearly true. All sounds, 44, for all words, I don't know, half a million, uh, for all connected speech. Well, that's infinite, probably. And it's all there on the chart, which we'll look at in just a second. It also shows how and where the sounds are made. And I'm going to point that out. Perhaps some of you know how it works, but in case you don't, or as a revision, I'm going to show you. It, it has built into it how and where the sounds are made. It also implies how sounds shape each other, because although there are 44 sounds, actually it's one system. One system. They all push against each other. They all shape each other. You can't really learn them as a, as a linear, you know, two today, two tomorrow, two next year, two when I get to first proficiency and so on. You need everything now. You can have a grammar syllabus, you can have a, you know, a vocab syllabus, but you can't have a prong syllabus. You need everything now. But that's okay. There's only 44 of them. And anyway, most learners already have at least half of those, 22. So that's only 22 strange sounds maximum. So no problem. Well, I, that's what I said. All the sounds are needed from the beginning. So you need a, a holistic uh, syllabus, not a linear syllabus. That's very convenient. It means every, all sounds are in circulation straight away. doesn't mean they're good at them all. It just means they're all in circulation. It just means all of them are going to start getting gradually better together. Not one suddenly gets better so you can go on to the next one. Like is it unit one, unit two, unit three? There's only one unit with PRON, which is unit everything. And we stay with that unit for the whole time, for our whole lives. <clears throat> Here we are. So here is a chart, and you've probably all seen this before. And if you look, I'm hoping that you can see my little mouse, because that's my pointer. And it's yes, up in yes. the, oh, you can see it. Okay, cool. So that's up in the top left now. And here we are, I'm moving it about. I'll try not to move it quick too quickly or, or we'll get lost. <clears throat> so um this is the, the second bit. I'm just going to show you around the chart a bit, and then we'll go on to making some new sounds. Um, you can't see me, so it's, I mean, I, I can, you know, uh, it's difficult to, um, it's difficult to actually mime and show you things. I can flick. I may, I may try to flick between this and, and you seeing me. But anyway, let's get going. <clears throat> Here. In this top left quadrant, you've got 12. All right. And now this, imagine there's a mouth here. And here's the front of the mouth. Here's the back of the mouth. Here's the top of the mouth. Here's the bottom of the mouth. In other words, there's a person looking over here. And this is the front of their mouth. And this is the back of their head over the other side. It's a mouth. It's a diagram. Of course, it's a diagram. It's a mouth. You know, you might see the top teeth are here and the bottom teeth are here. The tongue is waggling about in here. You get the picture. So here are the vowels from front 
to back. The tongue is at the front. We move the tongue back. We get these sounds. Move the tongue forward. It goes back here. And these are at the top of the mouth. That means the mouth is relatively closed. So if you just say, I can't mime to you now, so I'm just going to take a short cut, which is not what I do with my students. I'm going to say the sound E. Now, if you say that sound E, and could you also say the sound O? Now, say this one again, E, and this one again, O. Now, you got them. Say this one. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And now say this one. And now you're going to slide from here slowly back to here. So what we get is e like that. And I get my students to do that. They have fun doing that. Now, if we go like e and then stop, and I catch them in the middle. And of course, they go, they've arrived at a variety of places. But pretty soon, you can shape out of that e. It's much shorter. The lips are more relaxed. You notice the lips are spread here. E, and here the lips are more relaxed. They're not quite, <clears throat> they're not quite uh, neutral, but they're a little bit spread. E, and also this sound is much shorter. E, e, e. Mm. And now we can move back to E, stop. And we get to something a bit like, oh. And oh. everyone has lots of different, so, and we play about with the different places that people have got to. And out of that, we can shape oh, And again, it's, it's not as extreme as, as this one here, where the lips are really forward, ooh, and it's long, ooh. But here, the lips are a bit forward, and it's short, oh, oh, ooh, oh, oh. E. So very quickly, uh, by just playing with this sound and this sound, and then joining them together, we can stop at these two places along the way, and we get uh, these four sounds. And what students are finding is, number one, their tongue is going back. Here's the tongue forward. Make you, make the sound e and feel the tip of your tongue right e nearly touching the front teeth, not quite. And now say move really slow and see how your tongue goes back. E. And as your tongue goes back, you notice your lips coming forward. That's how it is with English. Tongue back, lips forward. Other languages do it differently, but that's how English does it. And then Let's say we can open the mouth a bit. Then we get this range of sounds. Eh, uh, oh. Go make this one, which is like, you know, if you just look like an idiot, uh, uh, make it some idiot sound, uh, but, but, which means no, you're using no muscles. The lips are relaxed and the jaws relax. If, uh, if you need to, uh, to make an a example for you, I'm here, okay? Yeah. Okay. Say that again. If you need uh, anyone to like to, to repeat after you, I'm here. Okay, cool. Okay, okay so make, make an idiot sound. Like make, sh relax your face completely and see what sound comes. Uh, uh, it's what I call idiot sound because you're just looking like, you, you know, how, how to look like an idiot. Um. Uh, that's a, a, a very important English vowel. And if we make it really short, we get this one. Uh. And the point about these two sounds is that there's no muscles involved. Relaxed lips, relaxed tongue, relaxed jaw. Uh, and then uh, lips forward, or. Oh. And the, down to the bottom here, again, now the mouth is open. Ah, 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 ah. And again, front to back. So here's the front of the mouth. And e, if we open the mouth, e, yeah. the tongue is at the front, the lips are spread. We just open the jaw. E, yeah. And so there you are. Jaw is more open down here. Jaw is more closed up here. Front to back. Front to back with the jaw a bit more open. Front to back, jaw open. Over here are the uh, diphthongs with the ones which end with uh, the ones which end with e, the ones which end with u. Uh. And how do we make diphthongs? Well, we just join things together. Join if we go over to the left, uh, and u. Uh, oh, just say them individually, uh. Oh, and now join. Oh, we go over here. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Look. Oh, 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 oh. And then we can go to here. What's this one? Well, it's eh. And now this e. Okay, say them separately. Eh, e. And now slide from here. A. Now quickly. A. And there we are. Where? There it is over there. Look. A. And so on. So we, the diphthongs are actually very easy. Once. 
once students have got these 12, the diphthongs come free of charge because they're just recycling the same, the same things. Now, down below, well, the thing about all these up the top, all these, is as they're vowels, there is no place in the mouth. They don't have a place. They just have a shape. And to get exactly the right vowel, you have to listen to it because you can't go to a place. You just have to listen to see how you are tuning the, the, the sound with your lips and your jaw and your tongue. It's like if you play the trombone, you don't really know where the note is. You just have to listen to it. You pull the slide in and out. Whereas if you play the piano, you know exactly where to find the note because it's just it's got its own button. And that's what these are like. So the consonants down here with these with these guys are uh, two two uh, surfaces of the mouth come together to make some kind of obstruction and that obstruction makes the consonant and it gives it a place so what's the sound okay you know it is per. what are the two surfaces which come together well you go to your mouth and you look and you say oh it's my two lips top and bottom lip yeah cool so those are the two surfaces if we go to this one here and you make this now, what are the two surfaces which come together? Well, it's one of the lips. Which one? It's the bottom one. And what's the other surface? Well, let me see. It's the teeth. It's the top teeth. Top teeth, bottom lip. And <clears throat> there we are. Now, if I voice it, I get v. And like if I voice one, I get b. So now here's the friction sound, unvoiced and voiced. Now, if I go a little bit further back, I get these other sounds. And uh, the stop sounds, front to back, back of the mouth, front of the mouth, friction sounds, front of the mouth, back of the mouth, nasals, front of the mouth, back of the mouth, and a few bits and pieces here, semi-vowels, uh, th two semi-vowels, three linking sounds in connected speech, those three. These two, which are kind of uh, cousins and confused by some people in some language groups. <clears throat> so, um, are there any questions that I should answer at the moment? Uh, let me see. Anyone uh, has got questions? No, I'm no, just going to have a. Uh, so far. Uh, where are we now? Go ahead. I'm just going to try and see if I can find my way so you can see my face, which is not beautiful, but it is it's better than the job. Show your face, and it's beautiful. Come on. Okay, now where is it? Do I, when I click to get out of here, just so I can come back into the screen, I forgot. I've forgotten now. Is it the one, the green what, one? What do you want to be showing? I want to, I want to show me. I want to speak to people. So uh, I see I me. You. I see you. You see me? Yes. Okay. That means, it, or in the full screen? In the full screen, yes. Okay. So look, um, are there any questions at the moment that, that come to mind? You don't have any yet. No. None so far. Okay. So we've been looking at the chart. And if any of you want to see how I introduce the chart, about a half hour lesson, you can go to the various YouTubes which show this. I've got lessons on YouTube, and I've got also about 43 minute videos. And you can access this through my, uh, through my, uh, my website to my blog, adrianunderhill.com. So I'm skipping things out right now just in order to go on to some other stuff. But if this is new to you and you'd like to see how to introduce the chart, how to use it, have a look at these videos, have a look at my blog. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, I'm gonna show you how to, um, how to make new sounds using the chart. So we're back on the chart now. And in fact, we're gonna to go to the next page Using one sound to discover others. Now I'm going to take you inside the mouth now, and I'm going to take you on some little guided tours. And um, here's the first one. I'm going to show you. We've just been working with the sound, with this sound, and I'm going to show you how to help your students find this one by starting from here. Does that sound good? All right. So look, see if I can find the chart again, which I can. Okay. Ah. It's, Everybody, it's, it's not yeah. showing. What? It's not showing the, the, the chart. 
Chart's not showing. Oh, I, I'm seeing the chart. I've got to do something else then. Okay, okay. so just, just wait. Maybe it's loading. No, I, I think I probably forgot to press share or something like that. Probably. Let me just exit this because I have now to click uh, end show. And then I have to go to what do I need to do now. I'll go there. Is this green button? Let's press, click the green button. Share. Now I think we have it. Yes. So make it bigger now, and it's all good. Is that okay? You can see it now? Yeah, yeah perfect. Okay, folks. What we're going to do is you make this sound. I'm not going to tell you what it is because we just made it. And there's no voice. Uh, and I say to you now, look at the two surfaces that make you, that enable you to say this. And you find it's your top teeth and the bottom lip. And you're pushing air out between top teeth and bottom lip. Just do that and feel it. And if you press the top teeth too hard, you kind of stop it. And if you don't press hard enough, you, you don't really get that sound. Now, when you're saying this sound, here's the question. Where is the tip of your tongue? I know you're not using it, but where is it? So you're saying the sound, where's the tip of your tongue? Yeah, it is at the bottom of your mouth, and it's just behind the lower teeth, the lower front teeth. It's not doing anything. It's like the fish resting at the bottom of the pool. I'm not doing anything. Now, when you're saying this sound, feel with your proprioception, that is you feel from inside that your teeth are lightly touching the bottom lip. So you're saying this. And while you're doing that, bring the tip of your tongue forward to replace the bottom lip. And as your tongue replaces the bottom lip, you'll suddenly make this sound. So let's just try that again. Make this sound. As you said, bring the tip of the tongue forward to replace the bottom lip. And whoops, suddenly you're there. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back. You're here. So now you've made that sound into that sound by taking the tip of your tongue forward. Now, here's something else cool. Make this sound, there's no voice, and the tip of the tongue is against the teeth. And if you now bring the tip of your tongue back a little in the mouth, that means in this direction, just keep making that sound, but move your tongue back and suddenly you'll be here. And you can't help it. So you're going, bring the tongue back, and you're making this sound. The S, the unvoiced S sound. Now, bring the tongue even further back. And even without uh, voicing it, you suddenly get to hear. So by just sliding the tongue back, we get, we can slide forward. And so suddenly the students not only find three different sounds, which may or may not be all in the mother tongue, but they see the very simple way they've moved from one sound to another. They've moved the tongue back just a few millimeters and forward just a few millimeters. And now if we say, okay, well, look, make this sound and put your voice in as well. This here plus voice. So now it's here. Now, again, move the tongue back, and now you get the voiced version. So you go, whoops, you get, and you're making the same movement as you did with these three, but you're with the voice, those three. So students, within just a few minutes, get an insight, first of all, into what's happening in their mouth, Secondly, into how to change one sound into another. And thirdly, they've just revised and studied, or perhaps learned, eight of the English consonants. There's only 24, so that's a third of them. And there's only two movements involved. This movement here for these two, uh, front teeth on lower lip, top teeth lower lip, replace lower lip with the uh, tongue, 
you get these two slide the tongue back and you get these two slide the tongue back more and you get these two notice they're all in pairs unvoiced voiced unvoiced voiced unvoiced voiced unvoiced voiced so simple let's just uh, go ahead and just so there's what we just done is found use that sound to to discover that one and we use that sound uh, then to discover that one and that one and we use that sound the voiced one to discover that and that so it's and now <clears throat> let's have a look at something else which is let's get flip back to the chart here's the chart now uh, if you make this sound uh and make it long then what are you doing well if you're going to make that sound long you're going to have your lips closed so where's the air coming out Mmm, mmm. Well, my lips are closed, and I'm making that sound. Mmm. Where's the sound coming out? Is it coming out of your ears? Mmm. Probably not. Well, if it is, you need attention. Mmm. So, and I say to the students, "Hey, look, pinch your nose." Mmm. Oh yeah, coming out my nose. Good. So now, uh, that is a, a, a nasal sound. The lips are closed. Because the lips are closed, the air. Is obliged to come out the nose. Okay. Now, make this position, but don't say the sound. In other words, you're ready, ready to say the sound, mm, but you're not going to say mm. You don't make any sound at all. You just hold the two lips together. Now, instead of making that, make this. And you see, it's exactly the same position, but you just do something different. You have the two lips, two lips together, push a little air out. Puh. Here, have the two lips together, but you don't push the air out. You, the air instead comes out of the nose. Or take this position and make this one. Puh. And you see this position is the same as this position, but you just do something different. So this one and this one and this, these three sounds all made in one position with the lips together mm. and here you release p, here you release and b, here you don't release or you take this one mm. now make that one mm. the mouth's open why doesn't the air come out of the mouth perhaps it is is your is the air coming out of your mouth you better check mm. well probably it isn't coming out of your mouth why not well, that's a good question Ask a student, why not? What's what's going on so it doesn't come out of your mouth? That's a puzzle. They really have to think about this and they have to play with the tongue and the mouth. And eventually they start to say, oh, well, it's not coming out because my tongue all the way around inside my teeth stops the air. Good. Now, make this. Mm, make it long. Mm. And now, just take the position, so you don't actually say the sound, take the position. And instead of saying that, say this. T -t -t. And you see that the exact the starting position is exactly the same. Mm -t -t. You do something different, sure. In this one, you press air out with a little, a little, a, a, a tiny little sort of explosion. But here, the air goes through the nose. Or if you do it voiced, you get this one. Duh, duh. But if you start with the closure. Don't release it, just the closure. You find it's the same position as here. Or take this position, and instead of saying that sound, say this one. And you see that you've started off with this position, and here's the same position, but you just do something different. You release the tongue a little bit so the air can come out over the top. Try it again. And now you just release the tongue a little, and over the top comes the air. And if you voice it, so what we've got here is that this sound is the same position as this, same position as this, same position as this, same position as this. 
That means these two and these two, and this were five sounds from this position. And remember, three sounds, this two and this one from this position. Three sounds, five sounds. And this one, which is mm, is the same position as this. K, 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 mm. So you have three sounds in this position. You do something a bit different, but the position is the same. So what I'm saying really is, look, three sounds out of that position, five out of that, three out of that. That's 11. That's nearly half the English consonants come from just three positions. So the whole thing is so easy and so simple. What's the complication? Why is everyone so stressed out about pronunciation? So stressed that they don't even bother to do it because they're hung up on, on grammar because all the tests are about grammar and vocabulary. But actually, the purpose of language is to communicate. And you can't do that unless people can understand you. <clears throat> so um, I've been showing you, let's just go back to the other. I've been showing you ways of exploring the mouth by seeing how all sounds are connected by very simple movements. Um, we'll have a look at one more, and then I'm going to... Uh, if you have any questions, we'll deal with some questions. But let's just go back. I'm going to take this one. Discover R, the English R sound. Maybe if I go forward, we'll get a chart here. Let's just see. Oh, yeah, here's a chart. Look. So now, <clears throat> you remember that in the first exercise, we made this sound. And then... We just slide the tongue back a little, slide the tongue back a bit more. Three sounds just with a small movement of the tongue. Now, if you do that voiced, move the tongue back, move the tongue back. Some people find it difficult to, to, to make this sound. How do you make that? Well, don't worry, just start here. Move the tongue back, move the tongue back a little. Just move the tongue back and you will arrive there. Now, this is so. Could you just do this, everybody? You go. Okay, do the, this one. Tongue back to this one. Tongue the, back to this one. Tongue back even further. Can you do the tongue back further? And you will end up here because the tongue goes, begins to retroflex. So we get. As you move the tongue further back, like off the chart, you end up here because what happens? You move the tongue back, and because your mouth curves away, there is no second surface anymore. Your tongue is sort of like almost feels like it's standing up a little bit in the mouth, but there's a big space above it because the tongue, the, 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 the roof of the mouth curves away. So now you suddenly get this new sound, which is not like a conventional consonant, Ur, the English R, Ur, Ur. and that's made just by the tongue standing up like that. And in fact, there is not a second surface. It's more like a vowel, more like a vowel. There's, uh, it's, a, it's a shape. It's not two surfaces. So that's, that's a cool way to find this sound. And we can find other shortcuts for all of these sounds, ways of getting from one to another. And you can see this on, uh, on my blog too. Uh, just before I stop, uh, these two, which, uh, how do we make these ones? Well, look, let's take this. Make this sound here, e, and make this sound here, uh, and now join them. Yeah. Ear, and then here's the consonant, ear. And I've got two of those, one each side of my head. Ear, ear. Now, if you make that sound like we have, you get a diphthong, ear, ear. But if you make it with a really strong tongue movement, yeah, yeah, yeah you get something like this, which is very close, but English calls this a consonant. It doesn't call it a vowel. Ear is a vowel. Move the tongue hard, yeah, yeah. and we get a consonant. So this is, is known as a semi-vowel, because for the reason I've just shown you, it's formed from that one. Uh, but it counts as a consonant, and it can go either side of uh, consonants in English, like in the word yes. And there's another semi-vowel, which we make this way. So we start here, oh, oh. and then we go to uh, oh. Oh. Wow. and that's this, that's, that's this 
That's this diphthong here, or, like in poor and sure, or. Yeah. Now, if you do this in this way, so it's a diphthong, or. But if you do it with a strong lip movement, wa, 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 you get this, which okay. English English uses as a consonant. But it's formed from this diphthong. So these two consonants, consonant sounds, are made from, pretty much made from these two diphthongs. And that's why these two are also known as semi-vowels. And it's also why, indirectly, why these are the two sounds plus this one that join words in uh, connected speech in, in English. So these are these are the three linking sounds that you keep coming across all the time uh, in connected speech. Well, now let's just see what's next. Uh, over to you. Um, if you have any questions or pronunciation problems you'd like me to try and say something about. Um, cool. There's one, um, Adrian. Yeah. Rua, she wants you to uh, give a hint on dark and light L. Okay. So let's go back here. Now, um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you into this. So I like to start any sound with another sound. So let's start here. Mm. Mm. You can all say the sound. Mm. It's a nasal sound. Mm. All the sound comes out the nose because the, the tongue blocks the air. Now, when you feel in your mouth with your proprioception, your inner sense of muscle, mm, you can feel the tip of the tongue touching the palate to stop the air. Mm. Mm. And the side of the tongue touching the teeth at the side. Mm. Mm. Now, if you leave the tongue there, except the tip of the tongue, mm, except, sorry, except the sides of the tongue, you let it away so the air can come over the sides of the tongue. Mm. And now, mm. the air now comes through the mouth. The sides of the tongue have dropped. So we're no longer here, mm, but the sides of the tongue have dropped. And we have this one. Oh. And you know when the side to drop because if you take that this position and you suck air in, you'll feel cold air over the sides of your tongue. Try it. So I'm saying, oh, I suck air in, and I can feel that it's cold over the side. The tip of the tongue is still in this place, but the sides mm. of the tongue have come down. Oh, mm. now that is that is a dark L, and that one can be continued. You can say it as long as you have some breath. Oh. Because, it has, because uh, there is no movement during it, and therefore you can just hold on to it. Oh, you can say that as long as you like. Oh, that's dark L. But when we make light L, we l, l, say, say that dark L. Now we suddenly take the tip of the tongue away from the, the front teeth. L, l, l. So, the starting position is here. Mm. Let keep the tip where it is, but let this let air over the sides of the tongue, and you get dark out. Ooh. If you uh, terminate dark out by taking the tip of the tongue quickly away from the front teeth, l l l. So we have l like in light, light. L. It starts with dark out. Notice, l. and then as soon as you flick the tongue away, l light like when there's a vowel coming because you can't move from dark l to a vowel oh you gotta, you gotta take the tip away l, and that gives you the light l you, of course you can end a word with a dark l like little little it's a kind of schwa but the tip of the tongue is in place all in the dark l but you begin the word little as it has a vowel coming by l, l, l. Dark L going into light L by uh, uh, mo uh, uh, flicking the tip of the tongue quickly away from behind the teeth. L. So those are the two, uh, dark L and light L. They're kind of different sounds, but they're related because uh, to do the light, you have to start with the dark, even if it's very quick. Now, 
does that answer your question or did I answer a different question? Um, Rue, do you think that he answered your question? I think it was perfect because I, I can now see the difference. But she'll say if she... Yeah, that's it. okay. Well, please do say. I mean, quite often I answer the wrong question. That's what teachers do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You clarify like perfectly. Thank you. Okay, cool. Good. Um, <clears throat> any other questions that people have? Uh, you put your questions in. I'm just going to give a couple of tips by way of finishing off. This is the tip that I said to you right at the beginning. Like, find a sound in your own mouth, then you can assist the learner. If you don't find it in your own mouth, you can't even begin. It's hopeless. And it's no good reading about it before the lesson and then telling the student out of memory. I think that's a terrible way to teach, to teach from memory. Teach from finding out in front of the students in real time what's going on. Um, say you are a guide in some of that beautiful tropical rainforest which exists. I, I think there's still some left in, in Brazil. Now, if you are a guide and you're taking some, you know, a few friends or less experienced people around a certain little bit, it's nice you are there, you are with them, and you experience the walk with them, and you encounter problems with them. And you're interesting and you're immediate because you are encountering the same as them. But supposing you were not actually encountering the problems, but just remembering a, deep, a book you read about rainforests, you would be a much less interesting and less immediate teacher. That's why I say this, find the sounds in your own mouth and then you can help your learner. Because then you know what has to be done and you can find your way of doing it. So teachers always say, repeat after me, but I say, don't repeat after me. What I say is, listen guys, I'm gonna say a, a sound or a word or a sentence and don't repeat after me. Whatever you do, don't repeat. But what I want you to do instead is hold that sentence in your mind's ear, inside your head. So supposing, I say to you a little sentence, and the sentence goes, we're talking about prom. Don't repeat. Can you hear that inside your head, in my voice? You wanna hear it again? I'll say it again, maybe a bit different. I will say it different. We're talking about prom. Don't repeat. Can you hear that? Can you hear it? How many words? How many words did I say? Yeah, five words. And how and you are listening in your head. You're listening to the prompt. You're listening to the melody. You're listening to the intonation. You're listening to the word order. And then I say, OK, get ready to say it. And now say it. We're talking about prompt. Uh, so in other words, I say to my students, don't repeat after me. Instead, listen to it inside. And then a couple of seconds later, I'll ask you, get ready to say it and then say it. And in this manner, you hear much more accurately what I actually said. Instead of blurting it out, you really, um, you really taste it and feel it and hear it inside in the inner, uh, in the pronunciation of the inner ear. Also, when people do say things aloud around the class, I say, I don't say, listen to who's correct. I say, listen to the differences. So different students are saying a sentence or a word or, or even a sound. I say, hey, can you hear the differences? Listen to the beautiful differences between everybody. Listen to that. Can you hear that and that one and him and her and her and him? Do you hear the differences? Cool. If you can hear the differences, you're really going somewhere. And that means that everyone is in the game. Everyone has a chance. We're not listening to good and bad. We're listening to difference and difference. Later, I might say, okay, that one that you said, uh, Maria. Maria, could you say it again? Okay, guys, could you all say it like Maria? And uh, so I, I've, I'm now using her model because I thought it was kind of quite good. Um, so can you hear the difference? I think brings everyone into the game. Um, and then I use this one, which this really fits with don't repeat after me because i say don't repeat after me now get ready to say it but don't <laughs> and now say it so don't repeat after me means people 
will be listening in their inner ear. They'll be hearing what you just said. Get ready to say it means it's kind of transferred to their inner mouth. They're rehearsing it. You're just about ready to say it. It's like when you're in a country where you don't speak much of the language and you have to think carefully and get rehearse something internally before you say it externally. And then I say, OK, now say it. And out it comes. And since they've been listening to it internally, they can be surprised when they say it externally. And they say, oh, wait a minute, I can do better than that. And they go back inside. Well, there's the chart. Are there any other questions, uh, Bruno or Eduardo? Yes, uh, there is a question from Ruana, and she wants to know if you think it's important to teach, teach the global stuff. And if, it, if you think it's important, then I use a way to do so. Sure. I mean, I don't think it's important. I think what's important is to teach what, what these students are interested in or what's current. So if they ask you about it or they hear about it, uh, by all means, teach it. If they become interested, teach it. Now, where does the girl stop on the, on the chart? Got it's behind here. So front either stop sound. P b t d. This is going back in the mouth. P b t d ch j back k g. And now we have um um. Uh, can you give me a stop? Can you give me an example? Um. No one said. Would you like her to give you an example? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Ru? Let's see if she's still online. Well, let's just take a simple one like water, which is. Oh, the, Batman. The she said Batman. Huh? She said Batman. Sorry, I didn't hear. I didn't catch that. Batman. Batman. Yes. Batman. Okay. Well, bat. I. That's the T as well. I'm going to take. It's easy to hear the glottal stop if there's a vowel after it. And since you've got the letter M after in Batman, let's take. I'm going to take my example of water. Same sound, but we've got a vowel. So now we've got. Water, it's that one. Water. That's the way I say it. Water. But uh, some people say water. Water. Uh, it's a glottal stop, and it's actually over here, but it's behind. It's even further back than this. It's a stop and a release, just like this is a stop and release. G. If you bring it forward in the mouth, you get warga, warga. You take it a bit further back, water, water. This is right into the very back of the tongue and the very back of the soft part of the palate. Water, water. So, uh, yes, by all means, teaching, teach. Uh, it's it's no extra effort. To, it's not a, not even a teaching. It's an exploration. It's a discovery. I don't teach anything. I get my students to discover. Yes, say say what? Uh, what are you doing there? Bring it forward in the mouth. Which which are the two bits of your mouth that are doing it? Get them to explore it. Ask them questions. Don't tell them anything. Just keep asking questions. I think that any of these things are worth teaching. Of course they are. Whatever whatever interests them, whatever fascinates them. If they hear it on a if they hear it on a recording that you're playing. Uh, Get them to try it out. If they hear an American speaking, get them to try that out. If they hear a, an Indian speaking English, get them to try that out. If they hear an Australian speaking English, get them to try that out. If they hear their favorite movie actor, get them to try that out. Get them to keep imitating and, and playing, being playful with all the sounds and with all um, pronunciations. Then they begin to be unafraid and they begin to move around effortlessly between pronunciations. And in fact, they can then choose how they want to sound. Pronunciation is not difficult. It's a game. So it's, it's, it's playful. And once you get the playfulness, you can, you can do more or less what you want. Sometimes it takes time, of course. It, it doesn't come suddenly. So look, here's the app. And you get the app. And um, you can have uh, the if, uh, that's the chart on the left. So there, this is simply the chart, and you've got a keyboard like the chart, and you, and you touch those, and you spell there, and see right here, you get the word, and you're trying to find persuade in those, and you hear what you're saying, you hear what you're typing, 
Or here you do the exercise the other way around. Here you've got ordinary keyboard and you get the phonetic spelling here and you are trying to find the actual spelling. And you can check, next, and you can do um, reading, speaking, listening, and writing uh, this way. What's the uh, name of that? It's called Sounds. It's uh, this one, here it is, Sounds, the pronunciation app, it's there. Yeah. And you have British or American English, a uh, British or American English chart. I've got two charts, one British, one American. Uh, you touch for sounds and words. You get different word lists. You can buy new word lists for all of the Macmillan books. Uh, you listen to the model. You can record your own voice. You can listen and compare and practice. You can listen, read, write, speak. And there's lots of different kinds of quiz on there. It's good for teachers. It's good for students. It's just a bit of fun. Um, and it gets people to be unafraid of using uh, phonemic symbols. And Look, this is me in China. The thing about China is everything's big, mm -hmm. including pronunciation charts. <laughs> so here's me in, in front. <laughs> so you see, if you're in China, it's easier to teach the consonants because you can reach them. But uh, you, need, you need a ladder to teach the, uh, <laughs> the vowels. Now, this was at a stage show, and it was a lot of fun, such, such, such a lot of fun. But that was in China, yeah. and. Uh, blog. There's the blog. There's the app, which we've just been talking about. There's a free version of the app you can download for free, but I recommend the one that costs about $3 because it's got much better functionality. You can get the charts we've just been looking at from uh, Macmillan. Videos. Well, if you go there, macmillanenglish.com pronunciation skills, but you can also access these. There's, there's 40 videos there each of three minutes. You can also access these through my blog. Handbook, Macmillan, Learning and Teaching Pronunciation. Training, I'm doing four training courses in the next few months in Egypt and uh, three in, uh, in the UK. You can find out about these on my blog. And if you invite me to Brazil, I come over to Brazil, do one there, that would be nice. Wonderful. And uh, that's really to say thank you. And maybe see you. Thank you very much, Adrian. It was it was really, really, really interesting. You know, I think that teachers in Brazil, not only Brazil but all over the world, uh, will benefit a lot from your talk. So it was it was fantastic. It was brilliant. Congratulations. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I love this. Thank you. Moving from one sound to another, and you can grasp the difference. Yeah, it's really interesting. It is so interesting, and when you start to do that, you suddenly the mystique of pronunciation disappears, and you realize that it's actually simple stuff, mm -hmm. and yeah. that there's no I've, need to be afraid. I've got a question, uh, but it's uh, more of out of curiosity. Um, how long did it take you to? Organize the charts. I mean, well, are you seeing my picture now, or are you, what are you seeing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can see you. You see me? Okay. Um, when? Um, well, let me think. Um, I can't say really. I mean, I don't know. Maybe uh, I think the first edition of the chart had was not as logical as this one. The first edition. Okay. Uh, and we printed that, and then we thought, wait a minute, we can do a bit better than this. Um, but actually, it's a principle that you can use for any languages, and I've done ones mm -hmm. with French and German, Arabic. Um, you can wow. do it for any language. Of course, each language has slightly different bits of logic, but you can uh, nearly always uh, compress that into a two-dimensional shape, which helps students and, and which helps. And so there are two things about a chart. One is that all the sounds are there, so you, it's like a whiteboard for sound. And the other thing is that it gives clues to how to make the sounds for teachers and students. Yeah, I don't know. I can't That's quite answer great. your question, Bruno, uh, Eduardo. Um, I have a question, uh, Adrian. Yeah, I work with uh, young learners, um, and I wonder. Uh, what's your advice in terms of using the charts? So uh, how early can teachers use the chart with their young learners? Straight away. Straight, Straight away. 
Okay. Look, you're not you are not teaching phonetic symbols. I never, 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 never teach phonetic symbols. And I tell everyone, don't teach phonetic symbols. That's not the point. The point is to help people proprioceptively to find different shapes and to hear with their ears that it's different, to make the neurological link between mouth position and ear and to get that freedom. Now, because English has funny spelling, we can't use the letters of the alphabet to denote the sounds. So we have to use something else. So as it happens, we use the phonetic symbols. But you know, there is no need to learn them. What we're learning is uh, the place in the mouth and the sound. And if people are learning anything, they are learning the position on the chart. They're not learning that little uh, squiggle, which is the phonetic symbol. Mm -hmm. However, after the kids have been at it a few days, they do know the symbols, but they, even without teaching. So to answer your question, I never teach the symbols, but I use the chart right from the beginning. And in fact, with kids, it's so quick because they're already in touch with their muscles. Yeah. Um, don't have another question. Um, Pronunciation is not advanced. Pronunciation comes immediately. It's the first thing to do with every class. Everyone needs it, even advanced. Yeah. Uh, if you could explain if there is a logic behind the use of stress on different syllables, is there a rule or not depending on the word? Well, there are approximate rules of thumb, but none of the rules are really uh, watertight. Um, I think the most important thing with stress is, uh, particularly perhaps for speakers of Latin languages is to really discover how English uses unstress. It's not the stress that's the problem, it's the unstress. And uh, when uh, learners of English become really aware of how English unstresses syllables, they're amazed. They can't believe that the language could still work. Um, but that's the point, and really. One could almost say that uh, mastering stress and unstress is as important as being good at the sounds themselves. It's, um, I think those two things are the key. And um, of course, if you play with word stress and with word unstress, that's the key thing. Because syllables are only stressed because the other ones are unstressed. And English makes a big difference. And it's important to make that big difference. And if you stress every syllable, even if you have wonderful pronunciation english guys won't, un won't get what's being said it's a strange thing and so languages which tend to be more um syllable timed uh and stress every syllable more or less uh, are likely to struggle when trying to be understood by speaking english so you're right that english the placement of stress uh, follows rules which are pretty hard to pin down and therefore best learned intuitively in my mind. But more important than that is being able to make a fairly simple binary distinction between stress and unstress. And the whole thing about unstress is not just that it's less energy, it's that the vowels change. The vowels change. Wow, what a terrible thing. How, what a what a tricky thing for a language to do. Well, that's what happens. There are three vowels which are nearly all the unstressed syllables. And in fact, schwa, which is probably 60% of the unstressed syllables. It's a magical sound. And yet, it, as a sound, it's nearly nothing. It's as near to nothing as you can get. And that's 60% of English syllables. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Even the Queen speaks like that. It's, 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 not like, it's not like it's some terrible way of speaking, which is what students think. Anyway, you're right. I mean, I think you're onto something if you follow through with, with stress, definitely. Stress and unstress. Unstress is the key, not stress. Thank you. Um, okay. Claire Venables, she wants to know if you've seen the colored chart. The color chart? Yeah, by Margaret Horrigan, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I know the colored charts, the original colored charts, which were used um, by the silent way approach to teaching. Um, 
but if these are different from that, then I, you better d describe to me. You mean just where a color is used instead of a phonetic symbol? I don't know, Claire, are you still there? What, what kind of chart is that? I'll try to see if I can get something online. Yeah, it's like very colorful. I don't know how she categorized the colors, but. But is it essentially a color stands for a sound? I don't know. I really don't know. Let's see. Wait a bit, Claire. And tell us a bit more about it. But anyway, um, we can check that later. Yeah, I mean, people make other charts. So some people make charts with pictures. Some uh -huh. people make charts with colors. Or you could just make charts with empty boxes. It all, it, it's, all, it's all the same. The chart is just a very great help. But if you make it with symbols, then at least people can use dictionaries. So that's the only advantage. Do we have any more questions, Do No, no, I think that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Okay. So, Adrian, so thank you very much for that. It was wonderful. I loved it. I'm gonna certainly start using uh, uh, these techniques with my students. Very looking forward to using, Good. Well, to using them. Good. And I think that the, the, the EOT Brazilian EOT community like thank you so much and owes you a lot for that because you do. Uh, from your heart, and it's very meaningful for us. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I have two articles one in MET. I don't know if you see that magazine, Modern English mm -hmm. Teacher. One yeah. article in January this year, and one coming out next month. So, if you or your uh, people in your in your group would be interested and can get hold of MET, they'll see a couple of four-page articles where I go into. Um, uh, a whole bunch of ideas on teaching pronunciation. Nice. That's very, that's wonderful. That's great. Okay, guys, well, it's nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you very much. We, we, we don't have words to, to thank you for the time you devoted to prepare the presentation and to deliver it. Uh, okay, um, my pleasure. Thank you. thank you. So just a final um, yeah. important, uh, important piece of information. For those yeah. who are watching the webinar now uh, and you need a certificate, uh, access bit.ly slash Brout Prawn Week 2018 certificate. So I'll say that again bit.ly slash Brout Prawn Week 2018 certificate. Just fill in the form and you receive the certificate by the end of March. Yeah, we're in March, by the end of March. And the form will be open only for 15 minutes, right? Yes, yeah, we're, we're closing the form in 15 minutes because it, uh, the certificate is offered only for those who attended the webinar live. So in case you watch this on YouTube uh, tomorrow or in a month time, you won't be able to get the certificate, unfortunately. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much again, Adrian. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Eduardo. And thank you to all the teachers uh, in your group. I wish you all success and happiness and uh, good courage in thank the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheerio.